Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And once again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are blessed that you can join us for this time in God's Word as we continue our study of Paul's second letter to Timothy. And this, I believe, is our, our ninth part of this study, ninth time in this study. And uh, we'll be picking up where we left off. We're going to be starting in 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 8. And we're going to do that right after Mark asks for God's blessing on our time together, because we need that. Oh Lord, we just thank you for this day, and we thank you for the, this your word. Yes. And just bring out all the things that we need to see in it, and get it in our lives so we can better do your will. Amen. Amen. And what we need to see more clearly is Jesus Christ. The more clearly we see him, the more we will be like him. Hallelujah. And therefore, it's a good thing that it starts with these words. 2 Timothy 2.8, remember Jesus Christ. <laughs> yes. Risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. Well, it's easy to say, remember Jesus Christ. Oh, I remember him. What does that mean to you? Every once in a while you give him, think about him? Or... This is a command of yeah. God. You know, last yeah, week Jesus. I think we talked a little bit about the word consider. Yes. That when in the scriptures, either Jesus or Paul talks about consider this, it means to give particular attention to it. Mm -hmm. All right? When, when the command of God, and that's what this is through the Apostle Paul, to remember Jesus Christ. Well, we're to set our mind on the things above. We're to have the mind of Christ. We are to remember him at all times. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, too much of Christianity is about visiting God every once in a while. True, a true right relationship with God is about having that relationship with him, walking hand in hand all the time, remembering him all the time, having our thoughts focused on him, having our mind fixed on him, having our eyes set on him, all right? So when he says, remember Jesus Christ, that's not once in a while. That's, that's not just, okay, as we do this study, it is about a lifetime that where your mind is thinking about Jesus Christ all the time. There's a song, it, I don't remember what period it is, but it was, you are always on my mind. Yes, is that a good old hymn? Yeah. Well, it's a Willie Nelson country western song, but the, that, that's it, you're always on my mind. That's your, always on my that mind. should be our anthem, that right. the Lord, you're Jesus. always on our mind. It does say pray without ceasing, mm -hmm. and if you're talking with God, without you're not ceasing. forgetting yeah. who God yeah. is. Uh, listening yeah. to him. The point here, though, is, and it really is important, is that we develop a habit of living, thinking about, conversing with, mm -hmm. a mind focused on Jesus, on the Father, on the things of God, and how we're to be living the things of God. It's not once in a while, okay? That's not what remember here means. Mm -hmm. He is risen from the dead. If you remember that he is risen from the dead, then you think about the conquering power of God the Father to bring triumph into the life of any believer. Because he has conquered death. And if he can conquer death, if he can save Jesus from the tomb, what is there going on in your life that God can't save you from? Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. You don't have any, I mean, what situation do you have going on in your life right now that is as bad as Christ being crucified, dying, and being buried, laid aside, dead, what, what do you have going on that's worse than that in your life? But God the Father raised him from the dead. That's what, he is risen from the dead. This is one of the most powerful statements, I'm telling you. Yes. I, when you need to, I, I share with, let me catch my breath here. <laughs> when Alice was in the hospital last year with cancer, and I said, I, was, I walked by, we were in a, a quote-unquote Christian, a hospital run by a, a Christian denomination. And that was a real blessing that we had that because it had a Christian atmosphere filled with scriptures all over. 
people on staff who knew the Lord, all right? So it was easy to converse about the Lord. But they're in the book shop, they, or, you know, they have a gift shop. little gift shop. <clears throat> there was a sign, and it said, don't tell God how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big your God is. That's right. When do we get to the place where that's our attitude? There is, we, we sing it, victory in Jesus. There's triumph, there's power in the blood. We need to get into that place where we are confessing the power of God to whom nothing is impossible. Absolutely nothing. And Paul, who's writing to Timothy here, would write to the church in Rome and say, listen, if God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son, gave him to die, to be buried, and then to rise, what good thing would he withhold from you? If he had the power to raise Jesus from the dead, what are you going on in your life that God can't deal with? You need to keep that in mind. You need to remember that all the time. Because the attacks of the enemy, the trials and tribulations of this world, many are the, are, are the afflictions, the tribulations of the righteous. They go on all the time. While you're breathing on this planet, you are in a place that, where the enemy roams freely. Yes. And that should be obvious. So think of, so here, you have a problem in your life, Look that problem straight in the eyes, because I know where it's coming from. It is coming from the enemy. Mm -hmm. Look that problem in the eyes and say, these words, he is risen. He is risen. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing you can do to me, oh enemy, adversary, you silly. There's nothing that you can do that my God cannot deliver me from. The other thing you might want to be aware of is, Satan, you've already been defeated. That's right. Because when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was over. He was publicly displayed on that cross, and Satan was publicly displayed as being defeated and disarmed. Amen. Please keep it in mind. And then Paul goes on, he's talking about the gospel that he preaches, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. So many people and so many churches are preaching a message. Come to God. Everything's going to be nice. Everything's mm -hmm. going to be easy. No, everything's going to be right. That's everything's right. going to be righteous. You need that right relationship with the Father. But Jesus said, count the cost. The man came to Jesus and said, I want to follow you. And Jesus looked at him and said, you know, the foxes have dens and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You better count the cost. Don't think that life gets easy. That's not the promise. You know what the promise is? Life gets triumphant. That's the sure. promise. Okay. Victory. When do you have a victory? When you have, every, every time that you have a problem arise and you look at that problem and say, my God is greater. When do people have victory? It's after a battle. Well, there's always a bat. That's the point. That's what he's saying here. He, he, but, but you have to have know that you've won it before you. And then you proclaim you go it. Yes. into the battle, you have to know that you're. It's already. It's a done deal. Yes. Yeah. That's the attitude. Because you have to have. the battle, the victory is, is the battle is the Lord's. The victory the is the Lord's. Lord's. Okay. And by the way, the other thing here is, uh, I, I haven't looked at a lot of Christian magazines in a long time, but I, I my memory is that you look on the back of most magazines or in the back, you see a lot of advertising for Bible schools, for seminaries, come be a minister. And they show cute young people on a lovely campus. <laughs> Paul suffered for the gospel. Yes. He suffered hardship. He yes. suffered hardship for his call to... The... If you think that it won't be that way with you, you're wrong. You better be prepared. If you believe that God is calling you to preach the gospel, you better be prepared because it's going to bring about a battle. A battle in which God will give you the victory, but a battle nevertheless. Mm -hmm. Paul suffered hardship. For preaching the gospel. Willingly. Mm -hmm. And you know what he said? 
Well, how, how can you even count that? How can you count that, that momentary light affliction, uh, light affliction mm. in view of the eternal weight of glory? <laughs> because you got your eyes on the eternal weight of glory. Right. You know why? Because you're remembering Jesus Christ raised from the dead. You have your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. That's why. It's not that there's not going to be a battle. It's not that when you get saved, all of the trials and tribulations go away. Oh, no. What happens is that you begin, his promise is that you will walk in the triumph of Christ right. Jesus. And he will deliver us out of them all. That's so Paul is in prison for preaching the gospel. Yes. But the word of God is not imprisoned. No. no, it is not. It didn't stop. That's how God, you know, I, I know a number of people who have had, and I'll put little quotes around here, prison ministries. Mm. As a matter of fact, there was a time many, many years ago, back in the uh, late 70s, that I used to go to a jail in upstate New York, and I'd have Bible studies with some of the prisoners there. That's the easy way. Yeah. I'm telling you, back in, back in the day, mm. when God called you to a prison ministry, <laughs> you know, you didn't get invited to go. You, you got sent, like Paul and Silas and Philippi. Mm -hmm. That's a prison ministry. Yeah when Paul was imprisoned. And the purpose, the whole purpose was to reach that jailer yes. whose name had been written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundation of the earth. Okay? And that, that leads right into, in verse 10, he said, For this reason I endure all things, for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ, and with it eternal glory. Isn't that the case of the jailer in Acts 16? Absolutely. Paul and Silas were wrongfully, wrongfully beaten and imprisoned. But it was for the sake of those who were chosen. It was for the sake of those. That account is not about Paul and Silas. Right. That account is about the jailer. About the jailer. Right. You know, he wasn't going to he wasn't going to no church on Sundays, yeah. that jailer. Yeah. But he obtained salvation through. What? Through the prison ministry of Paul, all right? Exactly. You just have to, listen, I'm not, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, but you need to be, you need to be, have your eyes open to go into this call. You need to have your eyes open to understand what it is to be used of God, all right? Because it's about the glory of God. It's not for your ease. It's not for your comfort. God will comfort you, all right? It's a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Hallelujah. We have to endure. No, you don't. Endure to the end. If Alice wanted to give me asparagus, if she put asparagus on my plate, I would probably eat it. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> I, I, I would. I don't like. I mean, well, you would at least give it a try. I've tried it. <laughs> I, 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 I think maybe you're getting the gist. I don't like asparagus. 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 I'd have to endure that. Yeah, you'd suffer through it. I'd suffer through it. Mm. If Alice put some coffee ice cream in front of me, no problem. I wouldn't have to endure it. Mm -hmm. I would. <laughs> but the point is, you endure the things that you that are unpleasant to you. Right. You have to endure the things that you don't want to be, you wish you didn't have to be doing or weren't doing. Right. I mean, you endure the hard things. But Jesus said, he who endures to the end, he will be saved. Yes. Because this life, this world here on this old planet is filled with the hard things. But we will be able to say, like Paul, I walk always in the triumph of Christ Jesus, if we endure if we press on, if we don't give up. If we deny him, he'll deny us. That's the, this is, listen, this is the statement of Jesus. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is reality. This is, this, is, this is not a joke, okay? You know, I'm just talking about Paul and Silas in that jail in Philippi. It talks about the fact that at midnight, in this, in this incredibly, I mean, we can't even conceive can't, right. of what this yeah. prison was like. This, this and it, prison today has no, no resemblance at all. To, to these old Roman prisons. Right. 
And they literally put him in the deepest, darkest part of that dungeon, just as a part of the punishment. Not only that, they chained him to the wall, him and Silas, he and Silas. Then, then they closed him behind the, the prison, the gates of the, of the cell. And what were they doing around midnight? Sing They're the singing praise. praises to God. They are proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. What do you think Jesus was doing right then? He was rejoicing. I'll tell you what he was doing. He was proclaiming, he was, he was proclaiming Jesus Christ before to the, the Father. Father. That's exactly right. I mean, I have this vision in my mind. I, I, you know, here's Paul and Silas in this pit, this hellish pit, and they are singing praises to God. They are proclaiming the name of Jesus. And Jesus is in the, before the throne of the Father saying, do you see my servant? Do you see my servant Paul? He is proclaiming Paul before the Father. Jesus has emotions. Yes. There's nothing wrong with emotions, <clears throat> keeping control. We, we joy is an emotion. I mean, yes. it expresses itself. He wept over Jerusalem mm -hmm. because they were not, not receiving him. I believe that Jesus was excited about Paul. <laughs> I know that Paul was excited about Jesus. Yes. But I think Jesus was excited about Paul. Can you imagine him saying in front of the Father, look at my servant Paul. Mm -hmm. Look at him in that place proclaiming my name. And I had this vision. The angels got excited. You think angels can get excited? Oh, yes. <laughs> if Jesus gets excited, I promise you the angels around him are going to get excited. They had a hallelujah ho down. They were <laughs> hopping up and down and praising God there in heaven. They shook the heavens. And the earth shook. And the bars of that cell flew open. The chains fell off the wall. I'm telling you, remember Christ Jesus crucified. Remember the power of God to deliver. Hallelujah. He will shake heaven and earth to deal with your situation, to deliver you from the promises, to deliver you according to the promise. Thank you, Jesus. If we're faithless, he remains faithful. That's a tough statement. Now, I don't think there's one of us, either here sitting at this table or out there watching, that hasn't failed at some point in time. Yeah. We can. We know that everyone will fail us. Everyone but even when we do, he remains faithful. And you know, we need what we need to do. If we fall short of the glory of God, we need to just go before Him. We need to repent and confess that. And when we do, He is faithful and just to forgive our sin. That's what it says. He never fails. Our Lord God never fails. So now. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, remind them of these things. Remind them of these things. Because it's got to be in our mind all the time. Solemnly charge them in the presence of God, not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. What do you think he means by don't teach the Christians there not to wrangle about words? Don't it's useless. Yeah, don't dispute about it. Don't dispute. You know, let, let's stay focused on the important thing. Let's remember Jesus. There's such division in the body of Christ today. And there's also such division in the body about things that, you know what, at the end of the day aren't going to matter a lot. So, to wrangle, you know, don't, it, it's like we become argumentative because you think this and I think that, or, or I wish this would happen in you. You know what? God's in control. That's right. Be, be prayerful. David, a man at God's own heart, prayed, put a guard over my mouth. You be careful what words come out of your mouth. Because remember, I, you know what? I can't see what's in your heart. But I can hear what's in your heart. By what you speak. By what you speak. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus. Put a guard over your mouth. Your tongue is supposed to be a fountain of life. And the only life you have in you is Jesus. So that's what should be flowing out of your mouth because it should be flowing out of your heart are words that proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Okay? Verse 15. 
I'm, I'm, now I'm reading from the New American Standard, and it says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. The King James says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman. Does not need to be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. Now, that, that's a better translation. Yes. Um, to be diligent, to, to, 400 years ago or so, when the King James was written at the end, or translated and published at the behest of King James the first, mm -hmm. I bet they knew what it meant to study. Yes. You see, now uh, I went to a Catholic college prep boys school run by Irish Christian brothers, mm -hmm. all boys, all preparatory for college. Uh, on average, we'd have a couple of hours homework every single night. And when, when one of those little Irish Christian brothers mm -hmm. told you to go study, he didn't mean to go think about this for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that meant you devoted yourself that evening. You totally devoted yourself to getting into that textbook, that study, and going into it in depth. Mm -hmm. So that I think in the other places in the King James, that word is... Translated as diligent. Diligent means you really apply yourself to it. You work at it. Yes. This is not, you can't be casual about this. You can't be a part-time Christian. You can't be a casual Christian. You've got to be diligent. You've got to really apply yourself to your relationship with the Lord. Because you're being challenged not to all the time. Just sit back and relax. You know what? I'll relax when I enter my rest. Mm -hmm. Till then, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna we keep have on a, working. We have eternity to rest. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna keep on stroking. I'm gonna keep on working. But the purpose that you do this is to show yourself approved unto God. Mm -hmm. We live in a world today. I don't think, I don't believe, and I could be wrong about this, but I, I don't think I am, where there is more focus on self-esteem and self-approval than there ever has been in the history of man. Yes. Which makes sense when you get into a little bit further on in Timothy when he says the first thing he says about the perilous last days is men will be lovers of self. The entire focus is on self. It's about self-esteem. I don't need self-esteem. I need to be esteemed of God. All right? Yes. If God says to me, you're doing okay, and I'm doing okay, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care what others think. But you have to show yourself approved unto God. You need to seek the approval of God. The thing, I, I did, for years, I did seminars, business seminars, on biblical principles in the workplace. And, and I, know, I know I've shared this before, that when I, the, when I first created this seminar that we did as a group, too, I called it uh, Biblical Principles for Success in the Workplace. I did that one time. After the first seminar, I changed it for the simple reason is you gather, you know, 100 Christians together and ask them to define success. And you're going to get 101, 102, 100. You're going to get an awful lot of different answers. What is success? The only answer to that is at the end of the day, when you come face to face to Jesus Christ, you hear these words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, yes. that you have been approved by God. That's the only measure of success. All of the worldly stuff that were so important to you, you're not, not taking it with you. I mean, that's what the Word of God says. You came into this world naked, you're going out naked. You're not taking anything with you. Unless you happen to be believe that you're an Egyptian and that's, you know, have your Cadillac buried with you. What is more important than that? I, I just, I have to take a minute and share this. Okay. Year, years ago, I was preaching in a little uh, Pentecostal church up in northern uh, central Florida, Ocala. And I was preaching there for a week. And this one, e one evening, I... I I spent the night and I was preaching about seeking the approval of God. That, that's got to be our target. And at the end of it, and it, it was a blessing, it really yeah. was, but at the end of it, Alice and I were going back to this little motel that we were staying at, and we had not eaten prior to that, and it was now it was a little bit late at night. Very so, very late. So <laughs> we, we stopped at a McDonald's on the way back to the motel to, to grab a quick bite. And we went in, and I used my bank debit card to pay for it. So we ordered something and I put my debit card in and I looked down at the machine. Now, you want to know something? I have done this in McDonald's around the world. 
I, I paid for food with my little debit card. But something was different this time. Because mm -hmm. I looked down at the machine, and on the, well, let me just tell you, I, can't, I, I asked the girl behind the counter, I said, do me a favor. I said, get the manager, I want to talk to the manager. And she got all nervous. She said, What's is something matter? wrong, something wrong? I said, there's nothing wrong, I just want to talk to the manager. So she went back and now she goes into the back and she comes back out with the manager. And they come walking to me and the manager, he's like, what's the, what's the matter? What, what's, what wrong? what's wrong? I said, there's nothing wrong. I said, I just need you to know that God just spoke to me through your debit card machine. Because I looked down and as many times as I put my card in there and it looked and it says approved, approved, right? It didn't say approved this time. I looked down at the de debit card machine and on that face it said, you are approved. And I said, God just spoke to me through this machine. And I got the opportunity to share with him and the other customers, who weren't there many because it was late, about how I had just been preaching about seeking the approval of God. I walk out of that church, I go here, and I looked at the machine and it says, you are approved. Now, if you don't think God could speak to me through a McDonald's oh, credit card yes. machine, you don't, know, you don't know the same God that I know. That's right. And it gets exciting from there. Yes. And that's the fullness of life. Jesus Christ came that we would have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life. And Jesus said this, even when you have abundance, your life doesn't consist of your possessions. It's not about the things you have. It is about what you are. It's about your relationship with the Lord. That's where abundant life comes from. And you know the fullness of that abundance when God says to you, you know what? You're approved. He started Jesus' ministry. Jesus went before John the Baptist, went into the Jordan River. And when he came out of that Jordan River, God the Father showed up. The Spirit, a dove, flew over him and said, Behold, my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Thank you, Lord. God will let people know that he's pleased with you. <clears throat> More importantly, he'll let you know that you're, he's pleased with you. Yes. That should be the great passion of our life is do the things we know to gain the approval of God. Forget self-approval. Forget self-esteem. Forget people struggle. They want other people to like them. And I see such a motivation. I want people to like me. You know what? I'm going to love people whether they like me or not. I'm going to, I'm going to love the people that hate me. Because that's the command of God. What I'm concerned about is that God is, a, see, is approving what I do. You're right in his eyes. Paul, the Apostle Paul said, if I am now seeking the approval of men, I cannot be a bondservant of God. It's not just that you shouldn't. You cannot spend your time seeking the approval of men and keep the approval of God. No man can serve two masters. You only have one Lord. That's right. And he's the only one that you need to get the approval of. <clears throat> and you know what? When you know that God is approving what you've done, you'll never be ashamed. That's right. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that, that you do let us know when we're doing right. That you'll know what we're doing wrong just to correct us and bring us back to that right path. But then, Lord, that you will, you will reach out and touch us, speak to us, and let us know that you approve. We praise you and thank you. And I pray that we would truly have lives that please you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I didn't get as far as I thought I might. I never do, I think. But be back with us again next week, and we'll pick it up right here in this 15th verse, because I'm going to tell you, there's more to come. God bless you and goodbye. Thank Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love.